to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve as we continue our study in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 4, continuing our study. Lord willing, tonight we'll finish chapter 4. Uh, beginning tonight at verse 20. Um, I look back, I think this is our fifth study in chapter 4. <laughs> um, so uh, follow along at the reading of God's Word, beginning in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 20, where the Scripture says, My son, attend to my words, incline thine heart unto my sayings, let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them uh, in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee um, a, a froward mouth and perverse lips. Put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and the, let uh, thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet. And let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Father, thank you for your word. Bless the study of your word tonight. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. So I call this study tonight, uh, Wisdom is the Way to Truth and Righteousness. Uh, and we know that the fear of the Lord, as we have been studying, is the beginning of of wisdom and as wisdom is uh, studied here animated in many cases uh, wisdom represents the truth of God's Word and we just never need to lose sight of that that's what wisdom wisdom comes from the truth of God's Word and we see the word word in our study tonight um, you see there in verse 20 my son attend unto my words and you see that a couple of other occasions in this passage and the words are the truth of God's word. So uh, just so we're focused in that, uh, I'm not going to turn back there, but the first five verses of chapter 2, we studied that we must pursue wisdom, incline ourselves to it, attend unto it, and, and to study it, and, to, um, and just pursue it with all diligence. And that's with every possible effort that we have. Uh, it's uh, chapter 3 and verse 19 we studied that wisdom is mandatory for spiritual fitness. Chapter 3 and verse 19, it says, The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth, by understanding hath he established the heavens, by his knowledge the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew. Uh, what those three verses tell us, um, or, is, or two verses, is that God created heaven and earth simply through his word. Uh, it says the Lord by wisdom. So by wisdom, God is a foundational element of everything is the wisdom of God. And if it was key and, and fundamental in the creation, it's obviously key and fundamental in our lives. And it says there in verse 21 in chapter 3, My son, let not them, that is the commandments or the words of God, depart from thine eyes, keep sound wisdom and discretion, so shall they be life unto thy soul and grace unto thy neck. Then shalt thou walk in thy way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be what sweet. <laughs> Amen. It's, it's truly the, the Word of God is foundational for everything we do, and it was from the very beginning designed that way as God created the world through His wisdom and power, if you will. So, uh, so we studied that uh, a couple of weeks ago and um, a couple of studies ago in chapter 4 that we're in. In verse 7, we see that wisdom is the principal thing. Um, therefore, get wisdom and with all they getting, get understanding. The principal things means that wisdom is preeminent because God is preeminent. Um, so we understand it is, not, it is to be desired, it is to be used, uh, and we're going to find out more about that wisdom tonight. It's actually the way of truth and righteousness. So um, and we're going to talk tonight about life and health. 
uh, with uh, in, in, in a couple of the verses here, <clears throat> uh, life uh, and health. So the word of God, the wisdom from God provides life, uh, obviously everlasting life, the very life that we have since wisdom was, in, was, was a fundamental part of the creation, then it actually gave us life because he created uh, all living beings as well as uh, all ev everything else, including our earth and solar system. Um, and so uh, tonight we're going to take a look at uh, not only that, life, but health. And, um, and the reason that, uh, the best I can surmise through the scripture, the reason that wisdom and understanding and God's word is critical for life and health is because it's for the reason of sin that we die. So uh, wisdom uh, provides life. Uh, the, one who, the one who puts their faith in today's world in Christ, uh, it preserves their life eternally. Uh, not only that, but um, through adherence to God's word and the application of it in our life, through obedience and placing a priority on it, it extends our life. We've seen that a couple of times already. We're going to see that again tonight. A longer life, generally speaking, and many of the Proverbs are generally speaking. It does not for every case. Um, if the Word of God provided a longer life for every person, uh, God would have to apologize to Stephen and the apostles who lost their lives early, right? So these things aren't carte blanche for everybody. Generally speaking, we get a longer life out of it. Uh, because if we're, if we're living a life of, that's righteous before God, upright uh, and just, then we'll find that we don't incur the illnesses and the, the, the calamities that would come along in life as much as perhaps others do, because God blesses His children. It doesn't mean that individuals are going to live longer, but what it does mean is, generally speaking, when, when we're a child of God, and we place a priority in God's word, or we do live longer, and we have better health. And so that doesn't necessarily mean that every person has better health. And you know what? We, well, we all have sinned, right? Even after we've been saved by the grace of God, we still sin, according to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8. If we say we don't sin, we're a liar, truth not in us. So we do sin, and for those sins, for every sin that we commit, because after all the sin we committed before the moment we were saved, all that stuff has been cleansed and washed away and forgotten. But since the day that we were saved, we have to confess those sins. That's the Lord's prescription. So we confess those. And when we confess them, when we uh, confess them, He forgives us of those sins and He cleanses us of all unrighteousness. So we understand that we have that process. Well, not everybody. I mean, take, for instance, communion. And I've used that a few times in, in 2 Corinthians. It tells us that that people have died and been very sick and other things because they have taken communion. It's just an example. Because they've partaken of the Lord's Supper unworthily. They didn't confess their sins before they did it. So they presumptuously enjoined themselves in fellowship with the Lord through the bread and the blood, if you will, the symbolization of that in communion, and the Lord's not happy with that. And a lot of people get sick and, and many die. So we understand that though there are things, that, so every believer, we have to take all things into consideration. The Lord disciplines us. We understand, take Ananias and Sapphira. God zapped them dead because they lied to the Holy Spirit. One incident in their life, uh, no different than Moses, who hit the rock the second time to get water out instead of speaking to it as the Lord instructed him. For that, he wasn't allowed to go to the promised land. But what a soldier of the Lord he was, you know. And so we understand that there are exceptions, and we don't know what they all are. Um, and so our perspective should be to do what Proverbs is telling us to do through God's Word. That is, as we'll study tonight, to seek God's Word, to pursue it, and to accept it, to retain it, uh, to en engulf ourselves into it, if you will, immerse ourselves, so that as it as it overtakes us that we live a different life than we would if we don't have God's Word living in us. So we're going to study the first few verses here, verses 20 to 23. So again, I call this the, uh, the way of truth and righteousness. And in these first few verses here, verses 20 to 23, I call this pursue a clean thought life. 
pursue a clean thought life. And it really, the thought life here pervades this whole uh, study uh, down to the end um, of this chapter. But, uh, and it it's really comes to play, and I will say this, the book of Proverbs, like many of the books, they're repetitive. We see the same things repeated over and over and over and over again. Um, what we have a tendency to do if we just read Proverbs is we read it and we see the same thing. We just sort of go over it. I read that already. I read that already. And we look for something different. The Lord, uh, by repetition, reminds us. <laughs> and Peter said, I, I'm not apologizing for reminding you about the truth of God's Word. So as many times as we get it in Proverbs, we need it. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> Because we never get it and perfect it. We can't perfect God's Word in our life. So the first few verses here I call, Pursue a Clean Thought Life. In verse 20, uh, my son, this is again Solomon speaking to his son. He said, attend to my words. The word in, in the, the verb tense here, uh, attend, means to keep on attending. Uh, so keep on attending to my words. If you look at chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, My son, attend unto my wisdom. So we see the same thought uh, being re-emphasized there in chapter 5 as well. It's an important aspect, as is every part of God's Word. But he speaks to his son and he says, Attend to my words. Keep on attending. And literally, pay close attention. You ever say that to one of your kids? You ever say it to an employee? <laughs> Pay close attention. Maybe to somebody you're trying to threaten. Pay close attention to this. You know, whatever it might be. We want somebody to really hear and understand, and we don't want any more of this. Listen to this carefully. And that's what this is, <laughs> because it's life and it's health. And so why wouldn't a father want his son to live and to live a longer life and to be healthy? Because the Word of God is life to us and health to us. So he said, attend uh, to my words. And of course here Solomon is speaking of the words that he was speaking, which is, if you will, the Word of God. So he was speaking God's Word. Uh, Attend unto my words. Um, and by the way, my words here, you'll see it uh, repeated in different ways. At the end of verse 20, you see it as my sayings, same thing. In verse 21, let them, referring to my words, my sayings, in the middle of verse 21, keep them, beginning of verse 22, for they, that is the words, God's word, in the middle of verse 22, them. So um, we see this, this reference to the word of God re-emphasized and, re and inserted in the scripture twice in each of these first three verses. My words, my words, my words. So it ought to, it ought to just grab us and shake us. My words. They're so important, as we saw back in verse 7 of this chapter, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get it, right? And with all you're getting, you'll get understanding. So in verse 20, my son, attend, that is keep on attending, listening very carefully, paying close attention to my words, and then incline thine ear unto my sayings. And this word incline means to stretch out toward or forth. Um, it means to be turned to it. So um, it's sort of like, uh, now here, um, he's speaking to his son to attend to his words and to incline them to his sayings. So it's like when you hear somebody speaking and you hear something important, you sort of want to get closer, you know. I mean, I, there are times when I hear something on the TV and Mary said, you know, I'll say to Mary or she'll say to me, what was that that was said? I don't know. Turn it up a little bit. And I, sometimes I'll get up and walk over to the TV, make sure I hear that. And that's really the kind of the principle here is make sure you get it, pay close attention so that you understand it. Now, what that really translates into is when we read and study God's word, don't let words and phrases go by that we don't understand. Stop. And pay attention. And that's really what it's about because we have the tendency to read and study and certain phrases they just go right on by and we don't pay much attention. We're looking for something, looking for something in particular. We're just maybe grasping the things that jump out at us. Uh, but we want to pay close attention to them and incline our ear. That literally is to get really close to, if you will, or stretch ourselves out towards it. Um, and so, uh, incline thine ear unto my sayings. My sayings are another way of saying my words. Uh, truly the word of, word of God, the wisdom of God. 
uh, the same thing. So in verse 21 uh, here, uh, we don't want to lose sight of the word. Let them not depart from thine eyes. If you don't want to depart from your eyes, it means keep your eyes. You've heard the expression, I've heard it all the time playing sports. Keep your eye on the goal, right? I mean, you've got a purpose, you've got a function, and I know that serious athletes, um, I know in this expression that we use a lot, that I use a lot and others use a lot that I play with, is the number one, the number one thing when you play a sport is to win. Now, but that doesn't mean you've got to cheat or do anything else or not have fun. So the purpose of your going out and competing should be to win. That's what competition is. You compete to win. So the purpose should be to win. But you never compromise, never compromise yourself to win. You never cheat. You never deceive. And there are a lot of people that would love to do that. You know, I mean, I'm a Dodgers fan. And a few years ago, Houston won the World Series. And it was proven that they cheated. Proven that they cheated. Um, and they didn't strip them of the title. But they cheated to get there. That's wrong. Don't ever. I mean, you play to win. And so people come and say, hey, Apollo, I, I coach teams in softball. They come to me and say, Coach, I'm sorry. I said, listen, you know, none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. We all make errors. The pros do the same thing. I said, the thing is, we play to win, but when you give your best effort, you've done what you, what you are expected to do. You gave your best effort. And nobody's going to be perfect and get them all the time. I'm excited uh, as a baseball player, to see people, professional players on the field, and like, I'm a third baseman, so I see a third baseman throw a wild to first base, and it's like, yeah, I did that yesterday. You know, it's like, you know, here are the best athletes in the world, they're doing the same thing. And it just lets you, it, it sort of grounds you in a perspective of what it is. But the thing is that while you're playing a sport, you want to keep your eyes on the goal. Your goal is to win the game and, and keep your eye on that goal because as you get in different scenarios, you know, for instance, I play third base and there's people on base and there's somebody at bat. I need to know where the runners are. I need to know how many outs there are. I need to know the skills and the abilities and the, the way the players uh, hit the ball and all that stuff. And you got all that stuff is going on and you got it in your mind. So when the ball's hit, there might be 50 different scenarios you could run into when it's hit that you know which one just like that. And that's sort of the way it is. You got to keep your eye on the goal. So don't lose sight of God's word. <clears throat> Literally, um, keep the word in view and apply it on every occasion. So let them not depart. Them refers to the word of God. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Um, keep them in the midst of thine heart. And here's where we get to the crux of the matter here. Keep them in your heart. A lot of us say, well, yeah, I feel it in my heart. And we got to understand heart doesn't mean the organ that pumps blood. Heart means our mind. Literally, it's our mind. It's the seat of emotions, it's the seat of motives and desires and our will and everything else. Everything, everything emanates from our mind, not from any other part of our body except it oozes some fluid or something, but it, it, everything comes from the mind. Um, so it says here that don't lose sight of the Word of God and keep them in the midst of thine heart, in the center. And uh, it's important because it's the principal thing in verse 7, and so being in the center of our mind, because the mind is our control center, being in the center of our mind literally means that not only are we protecting it uh, and cherishing it as the treasure that it is, but we consider it to be valuable and we want it to actually influence everything we say and everything we do and everything we think. So we want it right smack dab in the center. We want it to be the core of our mind um, as, we, as we go about our daily life. And when that happens, then we can reactively perform the will of God in situations that come up that we've never encountered before. Uh, because we know what, because we, we've internalized what righteousness is. And so we know not to get angry, not to start issuing profanities, you know, not to be mean towards somebody, not to get angry without sinning, uh, not to get angry and, and it being a sin. We can be angry and sin not, the scripture tells us. Um, and there are rare occasions to do that, but there are some. Uh, but it's always something that we, that because righteousness is the core principle that we're operating on, and there are things that aren't righteous that make us, make us angry, such as people changing genders, they call it, which you can't change your gender. It angers me, absolutely angers me, that, that anybody in our nation would do that, 
think about it, much less do it, and that they got a whole stream of people jumping on board with it. I'm still so, uh, you know, and here's what I believe it is. The devil is jading us. I've used that term uh, ever since I first started preaching. And that was a long time ago, almost 40 years ago. But I've used that because that's what the devil does. He just gets a little inch into the door. You know, he just wants a little. The scripture says, give no opportunity to the devil. And he wants a little bit of room, a little more room. When he gets a little bit of room, and we tolerate that, we live with that, he pushes the envelope a little more, and then that door just keeps opening a little wider, a little wider, a little wider. And before you know it, carte blanche, we're welcoming sin in our life, or sinful thoughts. And that's not a good thing. It's always a very dangerous thing. So the midst of our heart uh, to have the Word of God, uh, and that is in the midst of our mind, and let them not depart. Keep our eye on the Word of God. Why? Verse 22, the word for there makes this a purpose clause. And by the way, uh, the word attend in verse 20 is a command. Attend. Incline is a command. The word let in verse 21 is a command. Um, and keep is a command. God's commanding us. So these are not options. These are mandatory. And in verse 22, why has God commanded us to do these things? Because they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Health also is translated healing in, uh, in the book of Proverbs. Back in chapter 2, we used that a while back. But health also means healing. So, um, uh, and, and specifically it's, it's health, but it may be take on the connotation of uh, healing in some of the passages in uh, Proverbs. So what is it that is life unto us? The Word of God. It's life unto us. Um, that's the reason we're not we're to keep our eyes on the goal, if you will, and the reason that we're supposed to keep, uh, that is to obey uh, the Word of God and to guard its presence in the, in the center of our mind because literally the words of God are life unto us and those that find them uh, and then, of course, health to all their flesh. So we have these great benefits from the Word of God um, and I um, uh, wanted to go um, just take a brief look. By the way, uh, life, the Word of God referred to wisdom, my word, uh, understanding is uh, giving life or adding years to our life is given to us 44 times in the book of Proverbs. That's a lot of times. Um, and there are 30 cha 31 chapters, so there's, you know, about, there's uh, more than one average you know, per chapter. So it's very important that that's repeated over and over and over again. Uh, we need to accept that as being life. And I just want to take, remind, because not everybody that's here now was here when we talked about it before, but look at chapter 3 and verse 2, just a few verses here, um, to clarify what this life is. In uh, chapter 3 and verse 2, the scripture says, For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to you. They are my law, my commandments, meaning my word back in verse 1. If you look at verse 16 in chapter 3, it says, length of days is in her right hand, that is, in wisdom's right hand, the wisdom of God, uh, back in verse 13, happy is the man that findeth wisdom and gets understanding. So wisdom and understanding, again, it's God's word. So in verse 16, accompanying that is length of days and her left hand riches and honor. If you take a look at uh, chapter 7, uh, which we haven't gotten to yet, but we did glance at this before, um, excuse me, chapter 9, not 7, chapter 9 and verse 11, it says, For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. Uh, so it literally is life, and a, as a general principle in the life of believers, in chapter 10 and verse 27, the fear of the Lord prolongeth days. Um, the fear of the Lord, that reverential fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, prolongs days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. It's a general principle. Uh, I know we'll look and say, well, I know somebody that, that lived longer than me and they weren't a believer. Okay, that happens, right? Um, and we can't, we can't change that and it's the way God works. So um, in chapter 14 and verse 27, it says, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life 
to depart from the snares of death. A fountain of life, it's called. And one more, chapter 15 and verse 24, it says, The way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell beneath. That's uh, literally the, the grave, if you will. Um, and uh, the way of life is above to the wise. So we understand life comes from God. The extension of life comes from God. And God's wisdom and God's word provides length of days beyond what would be expected as an unbeliever in our life. So now we go back to finish up this first point that pursue a clean thought life. In uh, chapter 4 and verse 23, here the scripture says, um, Keep thy heart with all diligence. And the word keep is to guard, to guard our heart. Guard it with what? The word of God. Uh, because it's at the center of our heart. If we've been obedient and we've, re and we've received Christ by faith, um, as through God's grace He has given to us everlasting life and salvation. Um, so verse 23, keep or guard your heart with all diligence. And uh, diligence means to put forth every effort. But in, in, in this context, literally it means sincerity and purpose. Uh, the purpose is what? To guard our hearts with the word, of, the word of God that is in our hearts. We need to guard that. And our heart is our mind, to guard our mind. The, what is the devil doing? He's, he's going to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. He's like a hungry, roaring lion seeking to devour. So we need to keep our mind stayed on the Word of God uh, and, and keep it in view, as we talked about, and to, and to treasure it as preeminent. And so the most important thing to us is the Word of God. And so it literally gives us life. And so in verse 23, we need to keep our heart with all diligence and sincerity um, and in purpose for out of it are the issues of life. That is, out of our mind. The heart, we're talking about the mind. Out of our mind are the issues of life. It means what we think, what we intend, what our motives are, what our thoughts are, what our will is, what our desires are. All of the things that we decide and think about, all of that is controlled by the mind. And so verse 23 is to keep your mind, literally, with all sincerity and with the purpose because out of it are the issues of life. So, because, you know, um, what a, uh, uh, what is it? I got um, Proverbs 23 7. Look at that for a second. Uh, Proverbs 23 7. Another uh, nugget of truth. Uh, Proverbs. Uh, for as he thinketh in his heart, that is in his mind, so is he. <laughs> so you think a thought life is not important? We think our thought life is not evaluated by God every moment of every day? It is. It is. If you look at Matthew 5 and verse 28, just one more diversion from this uh, verse here. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 28, we find another unrelated, or relate, very much related, but different circumstance. And again, it just characterizes the importance of God's Word being at the center of our mind and for us to guard the presence of God's Word there, to treasure it as preeminent as it is. In Matthew 5, 28, uh, the Lord says, uh, as he spoke uh, from the mount in the Beatitudes there, he says, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his mind. So we commit sins with our mind. Just thinking about it. Jimmy Carter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what we think is really what we are because... Our thought life needs to be controlled by the Word of God. That's what we just looked at. Because out of our mind come all the issues of life. Whatever happens in our life, our mind is at the center of everything that we do. And uh, what is it Flip Wilson you know, got famous for? The devil made me do it. The devil didn't make us do anything. Yeah, he entices us. You know, 
he, he lays the bait out there and tries to get us to deviate off the straight and narrow path. Uh, but in our mind, we make a decision to do it. And so we need to guard, guard our mind. How do we guard it? With the Word of God. Because it needs to be at the center of our mind. And that's why we need to guard our mind, because that presence of God's Word, it's there. So everything we do is controlled by the mind. And so, well, I didn't mean to do that. Well, <laughs> the, yeah. <laughs> Um, and, you know, that, that perhaps has come into a, a, a very different light with a lot of public figures, politi especially political figures, in the last few years, where people will say things that are very demeaning towards somebody else, and they do it on such a regular basis. At one time, they'll get caught because it was something that everybody took exception to, and they say, well, I really didn't mean that. And then they go on to say what they did mean. Uh, lie, liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> Yeah, then they apologize, but they say, I didn't mean, I didn't mean it that way. Um, I'm not saying that you, that you don't ever, that something doesn't ever come out of your mouth that you don't mean, uh, but it does oftentimes, because we can usually be known by what we say. And I say that because you may say something to somebody, and I'm, I'm, I'm a good example for this, because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a person that gives the shortest version possible of events in my life. Uh, nobody tells shorter things than I do uh, to characterize stuff. And I'm just, it's the way I've always been. I'm a troubleshooter by, <laughs> by all standards. Uh, when something goes on, I, I can capsulize what happened in less than a shallow thimble. And then I go straight into trying to solve the problem. And when I shortcut things like that, People think I've dismissed it. People think that I didn't consider it important. And then I sort of have to go back and I have to cover some ground. And it was done unintentionally because I'm just going on to the next thing. I fully accept what they said, but I didn't say it. I didn't acknowledge it. I didn't make it plain. Um, so we can, we can uh, give the meaning to people that is different than what we intend. I understand that. But uh, generally speaking, we don't, we don't do it that way. So usually what we say is what we really mean. Um, and then when we get called on it, then we try to backtrack. I call it doing the backstroke. Do the backstroke, try to get out of trouble and just get all the way back and start again. Um, and my pastor that I was saved under said it this way. He's an old country boy from Gaffney, South Carolina. Uh, and uh, his father was the sheriff and he ran moonshine before he got saved. But he was a country boy and... Um, he said, um, in reference to things that we say, he said, um, he said, he referenced it, uh, made an analogy to like plucking the feathers off of a chicken on the top of a hill and throwing them to the wind. And he says, you'll never be able to get those feathers back and put them back in the chicken. So he said, be careful what you say. <laughs> be careful what you say. And I still remember that. I mean, this has been years ago. This is back in... Uh, oh, I don't know, 1980. Shoot, that yeah. Was <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Fif over 50 years ago. What's that? <laughs> and I still remember, but I've, but it's been a very, a very valuable lesson. I heard Chuck Swindoll preach a sermon. It's probably been 35 or 40 years ago, and he said a reputation is built in the crucible of pain, and he said it takes years to build a reputation. He says, but all it takes is a fleeting moment to destroy it, and it's gone. So, and I've always remembered that, too, because reputation is important, and we can't just fly off the handles. We've got to keep the Word of God in sight, and we've got to maintain control, which God gives us. He gives us with the power of the Holy Spirit, as the fruit of the Spirit, self-control. And so, if the Word of God is at the center of our mind, we'll be able, because we're enabled by the Holy Spirit, to control ourselves. Because as much as the Holy Spirit enables us, God doesn't control us. We have to control ourselves. That's why self-control is the fruit of the Spirit. Because the devil's bombarding us all the time with stuff that, you know, just pulls us away. And we have to defend against that. And we defend against it with the Word of God like Jesus did when he was tempted. And, if you will, through uh, a life that is true to God's Word. Now... 
Uh, so that's uh, pursue a clean thought life. And that's what that's all about. And this is all um, wisdom being the way to truth and righteousness. So in um, verses 24 and 27, I'm going to do 24, the next verse after 23, and then skip to the end and combine these two verses uh, to talk about prevent deceitfulness and deviation. Because these two verses speak of the same thing. That's why I want to cover them together. So in verses 24 uh, and 27, verse 24, put away, get rid of it. <laughs> put it away, by the way, is a once and for all commitment and decision to put it away. But it's a daily activity. We've, we've decided that we're not going to do it, but we have to be reminded constantly and we have to we have to reinforce the commitment in our own lives as part of guarding our mind in verse 23. So in verse 24, put away from thee what? Uh, a froward, that means crooked or deceitful. A froward mouth. Woo. <laughs> um, now, you know, and I, I hear people who call themselves believers and they still have a filthy mouth. And, um, and they think nothing of it. I mean, I see people on social media, people that I interact with, or at least people that I know in the venues that I'm in, and I see people who claim to be Christian, and they just, they just, it's just nonchalantly, and they're fully accepting of it. And I'm like, I don't believe a person's actually saved. They profess to be a believer, but I don't believe. It needs to be put away from us, a once and for all transaction, if you will, put away from thee, it's a command, uh, a froward mouth, and again, that's a deceitful mouth. And deceitful means that it includes falsehoods or lies. Better plainly put, <laughs> it's lies, it's deception. Um, and, you know, it's easy for us to, and, and you've heard the expression, uh, you know, from court, as I, I, I promise to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, <laughs> why would you have to say whole truth? Um, because the truth is truth. So if it's not whole truth, it's a lie, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a lie. So, so you should be able to just promise to tell the truth. But they say the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Truth means both of those, right? Absolute truth that comes from God's Word. But deceitfulness is, means that there's some intent to deceive. That's what that froward means. Some intent to deceive. So you've heard the expression, well, I didn't tell the whole truth. <laughs> I didn't. Well, so if you're withholding something, that has a tendency, if you intentionally withheld something that was pertinent to the, what you're saying to somebody, you might think that would paint it a little differently, if you will. And so maybe we do it because we'll use the excuse, well, I'm trying to protect somebody. Well, I didn't want to get them upset. I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to do that. I, and we have all these excuses why we don't tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, absolute truth. And we have different things that we do in order to, to justify ourselves. And there is no justification. Put that stuff away and have, don't ever bring it back again. Anything that would include any hint of deceitfulness uh, by what we say, because the mouth is what's included here. And then at the end of verse 24, and perverse lips, uh, perverse means deceptive, uh, means to, to wonder, if you will. And it's, to, it's that wondering from the truth. It could be an iota. It doesn't matter how small the, the, the wondering is. Errant, uh, which is a synonym for lies. And it could be deviant, if you will. Uh, and all of these are deceptive. The word perverse lips means deceptive or perverted, right? And perverted means that it's not the truth, but perverted lips, and it could be filthy, uh, could be, you know, any number of things. Uh, perverse lips put far from thee, so far <laughs> that you're not going to do it again, right? That's literally putting away, it's just another way of saying, put away, don't do it anymore, it's a command. And then in verse 27, turn not to the right hand nor to the left. So verse 24 talks about our mouth, the things that we say, and, uh, and, and of course all of these are the issues of life that come out of their mind, which is where the Word of God should be centered in our life. And in verse 27 talks about our path. It talks about the way we live our life. That's our behaviors, our deeds, our actions. Uh, to turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove your foot from evil. The evil is to the left and the right. 
And the, the straight and narrow word way is the way of truth. That is, and that means right down the line with God's word, no exceptions to what God's word says. And that's the straight and narrow path, no exceptions. You know, God told Joshua as he was going to take the promised land in Joshua chapter 1, he says, stay on the straight and narrow path. Don't go to the left. Don't go to the right. Stay straight. And then you'll be successful where you go. You'll be successful. Because he was going in to take a country uh, that 10 of the spies says there's no way possible for us to take it. Joshua and Caleb had faith to believe that God was going to enable them to take a land from people who were much stronger and much more powerful and much more numerous. They had every capability to overcome the Israelites, but two people believed that God would overcome that. And so uh, God told him what you can't do is deviate from the word of God. You can't deviate from the truth. Whatever I tell you to do, that's what you do. When I tell you to walk around the city seven times, you walk around the city seven times. Don't deviate, you know. When I tell you we're going to take that camp, you go. Don't deviate. Don't put a backup plan in. Don't go seek an alliance with another king somewhere and try to, you know, don't do that, you know. Don't think you need something other than God and what God has provided in order to accomplish the task. So uh, don't, don't let our speech, if you will, uh, be deceptive, and in verse 27, let's not our life, if you will, the way we live our life, be to the left or to the right, but let it be straight and narrow with the Word of God. So the last point here that I call is uh, in verses 25 and 26, and that is proceed on the path of righteousness. So if we're not going to deviate from it, we want to proceed on it. So in verse 25, here's how we do that. It says, let thine eyes, he's heard the word let uh, three times in these two verses, let twice in verse 25, let in the middle of verse 26. Well, let is a command each of these times. So let thine eyes look right on. <laughs> you know, they put blinders on horses so they can't be distracted, right? And something scare them and spook them and, you know, all that kind of stuff. We need to have spiritual blinders on, right? Because we need to look straight ahead. That is, our focus should always be God's word, God's will, God's way. That's the focus. Uh, don't, don't look left or right to find some other avenue of success because it'll be failure. So we need to um, <clears throat> let our eyes look right on at straight ahead, and that is on the straight and narrow because at, at the end of uh, verse, or in verse 27 there, don't go to the right hand or to the left. Straight on is the opposite of that. That is, uh, don't deviate. So let your eyes look right on and let thine eyelids look straight before. And using the eyes and the eyelids, um, you know, so the eyes are, our pupils are pointed, and our eyelids, I mean, you go like this, and, you know, your eyelids are pointed that way, and your eyes are pointed that way, right? <laughs> so need to make sure that it's just an emphasis to look straight down the path of righteousness and don't deviate. And whatever God's commanded, that's what we got to perform. We need to be obedient to the Word of God and submissive to His will, not inserting our will in the equation and doing things the way we want to do it. But here's what happens in our life. we got, we got something that we want to accomplish, and we many times will translate our, our desire and say, that's God's desire, because I'm God's child and I want that, so no doubt God's got that for me. Uh, we need to be careful with that. Uh, we, need to, we need to submit, and so how do we do that? Of course, we read God's Word, and God leads us and guides us. If you look at chapter 16 in Proverbs, and verse, uh, first three verses, and I love this because it, it applies here as well. Uh, it's good general advice for every person who wants to stay on the straight and narrow path and not go to the left and right, but look straight on, have our eyes and our eyelids focused on the straight and narrow path. Proverbs 16, 1, the preparations of the heart, and this is the arrangements that we would make, the plans we would make, the thoughts uh, that we would put into actions later. Um, it could include the order of things, uh, the breadth of things, or the restrictions we place on ourselves. But the preparations are, whatever those things are that we make by way of plans and thoughts and intents and ideas, these preparations of the heart, that is of the mind, the preparations of the mind, what? Uh, the phrase there in mean they belong to man so that's our responsibility we make plans we use our mind which God gave us and we make plans 
and we think about things and we make arrangements and and we we set dates and we set meetings and all that kind of stuff um so the preparations of the mind belong to man but the answer of the tongue and that is the voice of approval or disapproval the answer so we're going to make a decision to do something god answers us because when we decide, make a preparation we'll see it come in verse three in fullness but in verse one here but the answer of the tongue from the Lord is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, right? All the ways of a person are clean, that is, they're okay and they're approved. We approve everything that we want to plan. Um, so all of our ways that we choose to do, we choose them because we think it's right. We think it's permissible. We think it's going to be okay, right? Whatever the, the characterization you might give of whatever plan we're going to make. So the ways of a man, all of them are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. He literally looks at our motives, our, uh, our uh, morality, um, and, and character, uh, what we intend to accomplish, how we intend to accomplish it, what we're really trying to get out of it, what our intent and motives are. Hebrews 4.12 says God discerns our thoughts and intents. Uh, so <clears throat> all the ways of man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirits, that is, the little s, spirit, the spirit that's in us, whatever we decide, the issues of life come out of our mind, we understand from previous uh, in chapter 4. So in verse 3, commit your works unto the Lord. <clears throat> So commit them. The things that we do, commit them to the Lord. That means we, we literally commit, Lord, I'm doing this. I'm committing it because I believe that's what you want me to do. What happens then? This is what part I love. And thy thoughts shall be established. <laughs> that word established means formed or prepared. Thy thoughts shall be established. God is going to do that for us. We make our plans God establishes our thoughts. Uh, and it's, it's miraculous because we have submitted. Our, our, the core of our mind is, is centered on the word of God. And we intend, we intend to accomplish things in a righteous uh, manner. And so if we're doing it that way, God guides and directs us. So we go back to our text in chapter 4 and um, verse 25 so let thine eyes look right on, straight ahead, on the path of righteousness, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. That's the path of righteousness that's centered, if you will, in our mind. So in verse 26, ponder the path of thy feet. And the word ponder uh, means to think about it carefully. <laughs> Don't just, not a glancing thought. Ponder the path of thy feet. Now, which path is that? That's everything we do. It's everything we do. You know, we think about things, that's not our feet, that's our thoughts. But our thoughts translate into the issues of life. And that is, we decide then to handle something that's an issue in life. And we have hundreds of issues every day, hundreds of them. You know, we may hear something on a radio or television or something on a screen somewhere or see it, and then we have to make a decision about that. Is that approved, not approved, what do we do about it? You know, do we... You know, do I, do I block that person from ever, you know, contacting me again? I do a lot of that, by the way, a whole lot of it. It doesn't work too well, though, does it? When you block them, they can't contact you again. It does work. In social, in, in, in social media, you can block people and you never hear from them again. Not on your phone? Yes, you have a, uh, and uh, this is social media, yeah. so oh. which, which I receive on a phone or a computer. You get it in a tablet or whatever, but... When you, when you block somebody, they, they can't contact you ever again in any way on social media. If they got your phone number, they could call you. And if they, if they have your phone number, my phone number's not out there on social media. But if somebody knows my phone number, and I've got a whole ton of people that I've blocked on my phone. So if I don't ever want that person to talk to me again, I can just push a button that says block them, and they're gone. So I don't have to put up with people who are perverse or who... <laughs> I, or, or have evil intentions, or want to pester me, or try me, I don't have to put up with that, and so I block those. Uh, but that, that's the sense behind it. Ponder the paths of thy feet. So we need to think carefully about who we hang out with, 
uh, the things that we say, things that we approve, that we hear. But somebody may tell us uh, a joke that is inappropriate. And when we, and that's found in Ephesians chapter 5. And when we give approval, maybe it's just by smiling when they say it, it gives approval. And we can't approve of those things. So we've got to be careful not to do that. So ponder the path of your feet. And that means to think carefully about it, to focus on the truth and deal with the truth. And it says, and let, again, another command, let all thy ways be established. And we saw that the Lord establishes our ways in Proverbs 16, 3. So we focus and have our thoughts and intents to do the will of God. And then God establishes our thoughts. And so we know that we intend to do God's will. God may reshape, reform, redirect, stop, you know, forge right ahead. But it's got to be on the straight and narrow. And we always, there's always got to be that approval. And I believe that happens every time. That's why the, the mind has to be centered on the Word of God. Uh, because if it's not centered on the Word of God, we make hundreds if not thousands of decisions every day. Yeah, have decisions every day. And we can't possibly pick this up and look up every time we have a decision. Our mind has to be saturated by the Word of God so that as we encounter every issue of life, that we know what to do. We may not have ever encountered it before, but we'll know the way because we know that Proverbs 16, 1-3 tells us that when we, when we set our mind to do the right thing, God's going to establish our thoughts. And we know that the Holy Spirit will guide and direct us into the truth. If we're a student of the Word, and we show ourselves approved unto God, that we're going to get that kind of enablement from the Holy Spirit. God's not going to leave us out here in the dark if we're really intent on doing God's will. Now, if we're intent on doing our will and getting away with some things that we really want to do, or just ignore God's Word and think, well, maybe this is okay. It's a gray area. We'll call it that. It's a gray area. Well, it's probably black and white, and we just want to characterize it as gray, so it gives us freedom to do something that God doesn't want us to do. But, you know, either way, we're, we're disobedient if we do it that way. So we need to ponder the path that we make decisions on. So every decision in our life, and we make thousands of them a day, ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. That is, prepared and formed by the Word of God. And it's critically important. That's success. This is really the, uh, the nuts and bolts of what God told Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, verses 7, 8, and 9. And that is, don't deviate to the right or to the left. You stay on that straight and narrow path. And when you do, you're going to be successful. Now, successful doesn't mean I'm going to get a raise at work. It doesn't mean I'm going to make my wife happy. It doesn't mean I'm going to make my family happy. It doesn't mean I'm going to make my employer happy. What it means is that I'll live a, that that my action, my actions from that occasion, that's approved by God, that that will accomplish that which God wants. And we know that Jesus came and He said, "I came not to bring peace to the family, but division." So when we understand that, we understand success is not measured by happiness in the family. And people that think that go awry. They, they, they go to the left and the right because they've decided that peace and harmony in a family is much more important than getting your... Because if, if, you know, as, as parents, we're, we're responsible for our family. We're responsible for that. So we have to make godly decisions. And it's not popular with kids who are influenced by other kids at school whose parents aren't Christian and whose lifestyles are very different than ours. And they do a whole lot of things that their parents approve and we don't. We've got to be careful. And it applies to the grandkids and on down the line. And it actually goes to neighbors. You know, I mean, neighbor come and say, hey, won't you join us for the block party down the street here? I, I had a guy, my across the street neighbor. He's never invited me to his house. Um, and I know he's a, he's, he's a, he's a physician. He's, a, you know, he's well-to-do and, and he swings a lot of weight. So I'm out uh, cutting grass and he stops me and he comes over and says, Hey, Steve, he said, I'm having a get together over at the pool. He said, I'm having uh, some popular country singer or whatever. He said, that person's coming over to my house and he's going to be singing at the pool, you know, and, and, and a couple of members of his band, they're going to be playing at the pool. Come over, says, grab a drink or something. I look and say, well, I don't drink. <laughs> and I won't say his name, but I told him that. I said, I, I don't drink. And I said, I don't think I'm going to be coming over there. Well, you know, it, I'm not, I'm, my purpose is not to socialize with somebody on that basis. That's, that's not. 
I mean, if he wants me to come over and sit down and have a chat, you know, I can do that. Or if he wants to just have a chat, we've chatted several times across the street or on his side or my side of the street. But I'm not going to socialize with the guy. I hear him yelling and screaming and the people around him many times out in a, you can't actually see, but just a portion of his house. He's got a big circle driveway with a big fountain in front of his house. And you can hear yelling and screaming going on, you know, four, five, six times a year uh, out there without exception. And he's been divorced at least once. And I don't know if he's remarried, but he's got a girlfriend. He spent some time out of town with her and all that stuff. You know, he just lives a different lifestyle. But our purpose is not to bed down with these people and try to get their approval. So, uh, and, and I, it'd be easy to say, well, I just want to be good neighbors with the person. I'm going to go over there. No, I'm not going to do that. And I get to make the choice because it's my life to live. And I could do that. And I could do, I know Jesus went and ate with sinners, right? I understand that. And I've done the same thing. But you got to pick the occasions and you got to make sure when you do something like that, you're doing it to accomplish God's will, not your own. Not to gain friends, not to gain popularity. And that's probably one of the reasons why I don't have many friends because uh, anybody who wants to come over, they want to drink. People want to drink. That's, you know, I mean, if, if I'm not a socialite, but my backdoor neighbors claim to be Christians and they people over and I'll see posts on social media and there's always alcohol involved. And I'm always wondering, you know, really? Uh, you know, why? But that gets people over to visit you. Are they Catholic? No, no. No. Well, that's, if, if they're Catholic, that's that's almost a no. Right. Oh, I know. I got a Religious friend. Wrong. Got a friend I work with. I just heard from him today on social media, and uh, we're distant friends. Uh, but he, he, uh, and when I used to work with him, he was my boss. He kept the liquor cabinet for the Catholic Church. That guy did. He was Catholic. That's what he did. His his responsibility was to stock it and make sure it's fully stocked for the events that they would have. And I'm looking at him when he tells me this. I've been saved about a, you know six months or a year. And I said, his name is Bob. I said, Bob, I said, alcohol in the church? I said, you shouldn't even have it in your home. And you're responsible for handling the church? Inside I knew nothing the about the Catholic Inside church then. The church. What's that? Inside the church. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Along yeah. with bingo and everything yeah. else. Well, there's a Catholic school that's also a church not far from me. I think it's, anyway. And... Uh, they have a thing during the during the year they call um, uh, beer and and uh, barbecue. It's Catholic church. Yeah. <laughs> so the bottom line here ponder the path of your feet think carefully about every step we take all the issues of life come right out of the mind should be centered on the word of God and we can't abuse the word of God and so this whole thing is summed up in verse 27 turn not to the right or to the left remove remove your feet from evil don't go there and Ephesians chapter 5, that first half down to about verse 17, tells us how we're to remove our feet from evil. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, if you will. Father, we're thankful for your word, for its power, for its perfection. We thank you, Father, for instructing us in the ways of righteousness and for the embedding of your word in our minds, Father, that we might not deviate to the left or to the right from your plans and your design for our life. May we be totally conformed and submitted to your will in all that we do and all the issues of life. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.